Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Ball, and I will serve as the moderator of today's webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for M4A's fourth installment of the summer webinar series. The webinar today is titled Building Your Academy, Lessons Learned from the AU Eagles Leadership Academy. We are pleased to have with us today Spencer Bonahome, um, Senior Academic Counselor, American University. American University was the recipient of the 2020 N4A Model Practices Student Athlete Development Award. The Model Practices Award is presented annually to a university or college that displays best practices in their academic and student athlete development programming. M4A recognizes two Model Practices um, Award recipients, one in the area of academics and one in the area of student athlete development. Spencer, congratulations to you and your team at American University. Now for today's webinar. If you have questions throughout the course of the live webinar, feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please note, I will moderate a brief question and answer session at the conclusion of today's webinar. At this time, I would like to pass things off to Spencer so he can kick off today's presentation. Spencer, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much, Christine, and uh, thanks to everyone who is able to tune in so far today. Uh, I'm excited to share a lot more with you about our AU Eagles Leadership Academy and uh, hopefully give you some things that will help you at your own institutions. Um, just in, in the way of a brief introduction, again, my name is Spencer Bonahum. I work at American University as a senior academic counselor uh, and oversee all of our student athlete development and leadership programs. Uh, work a part of the awesome rock star student athlete support program team at AU. Um, a couple other things just to share about me. I am a proud graduate of Marquette University and uh, also my graduate degree from Ball State University's Chirp Chirp there. Uh, and again, just really excited to share what is almost four years worth of work in creating and changing and building out this Leadership Academy. So let's get into it. I'm going to start off with today's mission and goals. And I had to start off with a gif of my all-time favorite, D. Wade. Uh, so you can just imagine that I'm channeling his energy here, giving you the game plan for the session. Uh, my mission is just to share hopefully something of value with you and to have some fun along the way uh, sharing about our AU Eagles Leadership Academy. Um, you can see our goals here as well. This is, these are the things that I'm hoping to kind of guide our session today with, providing you an overview of the academy, uh, really getting into the process of how I went about creating it and implementing it and, and changes along the way. Uh, and then summarizing each of the four components of the academy uh, and sharing a lot of the lessons learned that have come up through the years of building this. And uh, a lot of those things are things that have come from other people in our N4A family, uh, the NCAA leadership development team, mentors, friends in the industry, uh, many of you. So um, hopefully I can pass some good things along to you today. So the AU Eagles Leadership Academy, as I've mentioned, the process for building this started over three years ago. Um, and I'm excited to share some of that progression with you today. Um, to start, I'll just share the big picture framework of the Academy. Uh, it's important to note that it's made up of a lot of different components. And um, so the way you'll see it split here is that two of the components are very intentionally focused on teaching and engaging in leadership development. Those are our Emerging Eagles and Rising Eagles programs. And then uh, on the other side, we have programs that are a little more focused on, on putting that into action, um, looking towards the future and finding ways to really practice leadership and develop other important skills and, and uh, things that will help our student athletes for well beyond their time at AU. But before we can go into the details of each of those components. We need to do a little rewind. Hopefully we've got some Hamilton fans out there. This is my favorite scene visually uh, in the musical. Uh, and so what I wanna talk about first is how did we get here? How do we get to that framework that I just shared and, and where should you start or things you should consider if this is something you're looking to build out at your institution? Uh, and the first thing I can say is that it really should start with establishing your mission and goals. And that's one of the reasons even that I started this presentation with showing you the mission and the goals for this session. Uh, but I actually want to rewind even a little bit further than that and talk about a couple of the other things that you can do um, early on and, and that I would advise to do early on. And the first is to gain support uh, from key people at your institution. For me, that started with my boss, Ashley Rosendahl, who's awesome. And luckily, she's been a supporter since day one uh, and really has helped me to build this out through the years. 
Uh, and it's also important to get support of other important people in the department, your athletic director, coaches, students. Uh, but I pushed that off a little bit. I, I wanted to start small. And so the other thing that uh, I think is important before establishing your mission and goals is actually our lesson learned number one for today. And that is to learn from your people. So the question that we asked was, what do our key stakeholders need and what do they want? And we wanted to avoid you know, falling into that trap of just deciding what they need for them or thinking that we have a great idea for a program and running with it without really getting the input. So uh, we went about determining what our key stakeholders needed in two different ways. The first was a, a really extensive survey of our student athletes. And we asked all types of questions on this. We asked questions about um, leadership, about what kind of events they'd want to see happen, speakers, cohort programs, all kinds of things there. We asked questions about how frequently they would want to meet for programs. Um, we asked a lot of questions about what topics they were most interested in and would most like to engage in. Um, and then our team actually also used it as an opportunity to ask some academic related questions as well. Um, I think I'm fortunate in a lot of ways to have a hybrid role where I play both a part in student athlete development as well as academics. And so again, we used it as a chance to really uh, check in on that area and determine you know, what else we could be doing. The other thing I'll share about surveying student athletes is um, it, get creative in how you get responses. I think often I've done things in the past and have not been able to get a, a very good response rate from students. And so we got creative. I, I took, took advantage of our team of academic advisors and we asked our coaches if we could join the end of team meetings or find other times to just get the team together for 10 minutes. And then we shared the survey with them in that setting. Um, that way we knew we were getting a, a lot of response and we could help answer questions if people had them as they were doing it. Um, and that really helped us to get a full picture of, of what our students were thinking. And then on the other side, um, we had a survey for our coaches. This was a little more open-ended, um, really for them to share more broad feedback and input on what they see on their teams and what they would like to see in the leadership development for their student athletes. Um, beyond that survey, I sat down with as many coaches as I could. And I think I ended up sitting down with all of our head coaches and a, a good number of our assistant coaches to kind of pick their brains about things as well. Uh, and so that's where we started, learning from our people. And then that leads to our lesson learned number two, which is start with why. A little shout out to Simon Sinek here in his book. If you haven't read that, it's a, it's a good read. Um, but after gathering all that information, it was important for us to establish a mission and goals for the program. Um, that establishing those things is the framework for everything else. So the question we kind of asked is, what are we really trying to accomplish? And based on all the information we've taken in, what is it that we're here to do? I mentioned earlier, I, I used to fall a little bit into the trap of just having a great idea for a program and forcing it forward because I thought it was a good idea. And then I stopped and learned to use this process of establishing the mission and goals, using the, the survey information, and then letting those things guide the programs. Um, so you can see our mission and our goals here on the screen for the AU Eagles Leadership Academy. And, um, What's great about these is every time we're considering an addition or a change to the program, we go back to these and we ask if whatever new thing we're looking at is gonna meet one of these goals or you know, where does it fall under? What, what are we actually accomplishing with this new program? Um, the last thing I'll share here too is that we've made small changes to these over the years. Again, this was about three years ago that these were established. And so some of our priorities have changed in that time. And, we've learned from the programs that we've created. And so we've been able to make the tweaks necessary and make sure that these things are still guiding all of our work. So now I'll take a step back and uh, look at our overall framework again, now that we've talked through sort of the, the pre-work before you even get to developing the programs. And um, just wanna give a quick note about frameworks and about curriculum and this comes from a lot of the common questions, one that I had when I was first seeking to create a leadership academy, but then also questions that I've explored with, with friends and colleagues. And that's often, what should the framework be? What topics should we cover? How do I create the curriculum? Some of those kinds of things. And I'll say from talking to so many different people in the field, there's no one right framework, right? Like a lot of places have one leadership institute that's one cohort of students 
Others have different stages of leadership development. Um, others like ours have some cohort based programs along with some individual workshops and some signature events and things like that. So again, to me, there's not one best version, but what I believe is that your academy needs to be what is needed at your institution. And so again, that's why the initial assessment to me is so important that you understand what your institution needs. You understand what your, what your student athletes need that might be different from what we're doing at American University and what Georgetown down the road from me, that what they're doing there and, and everything else. Um, luckily for us, we're fortunate to have the buy-in of the coaches and administration and bringing them into the process of creating this was an important part of, of getting that buy-in. Um, so another example, as far as, you know, what's right, what's wrong, the Emerging Eagles program is required for all of our student athletes. That might not be possible at some other places, depending on the number of student athletes that you have or whether or not all of the coaches are on board with the program. And, and so that's okay. So you need to learn from those things and create what fits for your institution. And then just a quick note on curriculum, I would give a similar answer there as far as, you know, what's the right curriculum if you've done any kind of reading about leadership, different theories or, or books on leadership, there's obviously many different ways to do it and even more ways to try to, to teach it and help people develop in it. So um, what I would say is throughout this, I'll share some of the topics that we cover, but especially with leadership, there's so many different ways to do it. So I really go back to that question of what are you trying to accomplish and then letting that guide how you choose topics and curriculum. All right, so let's dive in to the first of the four programs that I mentioned there. It's called Emerging Eagles. It's kind of our foundation program for the academy. Um, you can see the mission there included on the slide. And again, it's really focused on helping all of our student athletes explore their leadership, find ways for them to really put that leadership into action in their own way, um, regardless of their role on the team, whether they're a captain, a senior, a freshman, whatever it is, help them find some way to improve on their own self-leadership. Um, it's a four week seminar. So it's, a, it's again, a, a quick thing that all of our student athletes go through to really set a foundation, set some common language for them to use with their teammates. Um, and for us, the student athletes go through it when they are sophomores um, and we try to schedule it to fit sometime during the off season. So it's sort of a program that repeats itself many times throughout the year. Um, you can see some of the topics here on the screen, growth mindset, values-based leadership. Uh, we use the DISC assessment with this group. So every one of our student athletes gets exposed to the DISC assessment um, during their time at AU. And again, that helps in creating sort of that common language and understanding that uh, they may not be in a session with all of their teammates, but then when they're out of that session, they know that all their teammates have done this same DISC assessment and they can use that in working together. Um, the other thing I'll mention with this one is you can see in our photo here, three of our student athletes have the nice blue pullovers on. Those are our student athlete facilitators. Uh, and that was new this year. Uh, as the program had been built out, we had the opportunity to take some of our kind of leadership academy graduates that had been through multiple stages of the academy and give them the chance to really put some of their leadership into action by facilitating and serving kind of as a mentor to these sophomore student athletes going through Emerging Eagles. And so I was really proud to see that grow this year. and. Uh, the results from the student participants was that it was great to have a peer helping teach and coach them up on leadership rather than it just always being me uh, doing that stuff. Um, the last thing I'll say about this is just a common question about um, when do we hold our sessions and how do we decide on it being sophomores and I'll talk a little more about the sophomore piece in a minute but uh, the big question is when do we hold sessions and how do you make the schedule work and for me that leads to, to lesson learned number three which is to meet your students where they are. Um, so again, a big question is often how, how often should we meet? When do we meet? What's required? What's not? Uh, and to me, the biggest thing is listen to your people. What I mentioned before, especially listening to the students, you have to connect with them in a time and a place and a setting that really works well for them. And so you might be asking, why do I have a, a Denver Broncos jersey on the screen here? Uh, to me, that represents when I actually learned this lesson the hard way. Um, and it was before I had done the initial assessment of the Leadership Academy, I had tried rolling out a program like Emerging Eagles. And we landed on Sunday afternoons to be the meeting time. 
I landed on that with just a consultation with my supervisor and looking at schedules and deciding that it worked best, but I did not get any student input on it. And one student showed up in a Broncos jersey five straight weeks on Sundays in the fall. And sure enough, his survey at the end of the program was a huge rant about missing football games of his favorite team and taking away time on his Sunday afternoon. Uh, and so this is just one example, but again, it came before I surveyed student athletes. So I hadn't really taken that chance to engage with what do you need? What do you want? And how can we meet you in a place that makes sense for you? Um, if you've ever done any required programming, you know that there's often pushback no matter what you do. So the more you can do to try to cut through that and create things that are going to fit for a good time for your student athletes at least. And then hopefully once they get there, they'll see the benefit and, and know that even though it was required, it was something that they enjoyed. Uh, but you got to try to remove some of those other barriers. Um, then just to follow the end of that story that the lesson learned was when we did the survey, we asked what would be a good day of the week that students would want to meet. And the resounding results were Mondays and Tuesdays, which for us was great because they're days without competitions for the most part. Um, so we could move things to be in the evenings there um, and really fit for what our student athletes needed and wanted a little bit more. Um, the other question that you see on the screen here is why don't you start with freshmen? So I mentioned that our Emerging Eagles program is all of our sophomores. And again, this is a lesson in learning from what's going on at your institution and meeting your students where they are. Um, at AU, we have a course that's called the American University Experience and all first year students at the university take the course. Uh, we have our first year student athletes in sections of the course together for the fall semester. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to get to teach those. And so for us, we have that really detailed touch point with our freshman student athletes in the AUX class. And so if we started with freshmen, we kind of came to the conclusion that it would feel like overload for them to have their whole AUX class with me all fall and then throw them into a leadership academy program. I honestly thought that they would be sick of me. Um, and it's not only something that was just came from thoughts, but we actually tried it the first year um, that all of our student athletes were in AUX together. We had some of our freshmen do emerging Eagles as well. Uh, and it was overload. So we've shifted it at this point. We learned from that. And now we're trying to meet our students at a place that's a little better for them and connecting with them during their sophomore year. So that was Emerging Eagles, the foundation of the Academy. And now we'll go to, to part two, which is Rising Eagles. Again, you can see our mission there. I wanted to make sure I was consistent in sharing that to again reiterate that each level of this, we have a mission and goals that go along with it. And I didn't list all the goals on the screens for, for all of this to not overload the slides, but um, the goals are really what we use to guide each individual session. So rather than saying, here is a topic that I want to cover, we say, what is the goal of Rising Eagles as a whole? And then what topics can we choose to help us meet those goals? So and as a whole, Rising Eagles is our more advanced leadership development program. Um, you can apply to be a part of it after you've completed Emerging Eagles. So this is the one where it's, you, there's a little more buy-in from the student athletes. They're making the choice to step up and apply to be a part of it. It's juniors and seniors. Uh, we meet monthly and um, that goes throughout the course of the year. So we typically end up meeting between 10 and 11 uh, sessions over the course of the year. And then we have a lot of touch points in between those full group meetings. So um, this group has a lot more engagement outside of those sessions where They'll have one-on-ones with me to discuss their progress in their leadership journey. Uh, I'll give them homework to talk with a coach or a teammate or a group of teammates to share, you know, some of the things they're working on in their leadership and how their coach or how their teammates might see those things playing out and how they can give them advice and help and accountability in that journey. Um, another thing that I'll share, uh, I, I mentioned here, oops, sorry, I mentioned here that um, students can apply to be a part of this after they've completed Emerging Eagles. And uh, another, this is a lesson learned, but it's a tip that falls right in Rising Eagles is to use your applications wisely. And what I mean by that is, what I've learned to do is as a part of that application, I actually ask the student athletes who are applying to share what are topics that are interested to them or um, what are areas of leadership that your team needs additional support in. Um, and so, 
beyond learning, you know, why they want to be a part of this program, it gives me a great roadmap for things that they're thinking about. And then I use that in building the curriculum for that year. So it's not a standard curriculum that's exactly the same from year to year. I truly bring the students into that process of sharing what they need, what they want, and um, then we can try to adapt the, the goals and the specifics of the curriculum in, in those sessions to really fit with what they're looking for. I think the other thing that it does is it creates some buy-in and some engagement from them from the start. So on week one, I'll tell them, hey, here's what you all said in your applications. Here are the things that are important to your teams and we'll address those throughout the course of this year. And I give them a chance at the end of every session to share if there are new things that have come up, if something's going on in their team that they want to share with the group uh, and kind of throw it around for ideas, we'll do all of that here in the Rising Eagles format. Uh, and so then lastly, I'll just share again, this group is really focused on putting leadership into action and leading others. So um, we have a whole set of different topics and um, I just mentioned the topics are always rotating based on student feedback, but um, some of the things from this past year were um, emotional intelligence was a huge one that was kind of a thread throughout the program um, and it touched in a lot of the different sessions there. Um, we did a lot with trust building. We used the, the strengths assessment to, to talk about strengths-based leadership. Um, had some great sessions on positive team culture and how you can build that, um, how you manage conflicts and, and face adversity and some of the challenging situations. So uh, some definitely some deeper topics and some really great chances for the students to see where these things apply to their teams uh, and to their lives. All right, lesson learned number four. This is a great gift. I have to give a shout out to my friend, Bryn Seidenstricker. She tweeted this one at me uh, in the creation of this presentation. Lesson learned number four is how do you get people to participate? And I thought this gift was very uh, fitting for this topic because if you're like me, you've maybe felt like the, the girl in this gift of trying to get people to participate in a program and maybe people not showing up or not understanding the, the benefit that it can bring. Um, but in, in all seriousness, I do often get asked, you know, how do you get people to participate? And I mentioned just now, speaking specifically to Rising Eagles, that the students need to apply. So that even in and of itself provides a little bit of another barrier for people to really step in and, and want to be a part of it. And so a couple of different things that we do. Uh, one is coach nominations. So specifically for Rising Eagles, we, we let our coaches nominate people that are maybe on their radar as maybe they're already a captain or someone they see some leadership potential in that they think could benefit from the extra development through the program. Uh, but we also know that there are other students who maybe are not identified by their coach as leaders who can really benefit from a program and grow in a program like this. So um, this is open to, to anyone to apply, not just those that are nominated by their coach. Um, and so there's other ways that we need to try to connect with those people. Um, you can see on the screen here, connect individually, develop collectively. That's one of my sort of big catchphrases or keys that I use is I, I really try to connect with people one-on-one -on -one individually and really invite them in. So uh, for a program like Rising Eagles or some of the others that I'll get to, even workshops that we do, I'll reach out to people individually and say, hey, I just thought you should know we're, we've got this program going on and I think that you would be a great fit for it and um, I'd love for you to check it out. Often that individual outreach really kind of turns on the light bulb for a student and helps them see, oh, maybe this is something I should explore. Um, and then beyond that, I really advise that you use your people. So luckily for me, I can connect individually with most of our student athletes because as I mentioned, they're all in my class freshman year. So uh, from day one, I, I pretty much get to know every single student athlete that comes through AU. Uh, but even still, some of my team members on the student athlete support program, they know the student athletes on the teams that they support more than I do. So use your people, other academic advisors, um, learning specialists, coaches, like make sure that the people around you know what programs are, what programs are going on. You can ask them to recommend people to you, then you can reach out to them. Or, you know, what I do with my team is they know what programs are going on from Leadership Academy. And I say, you know, Aaron, Lydia, my, my team members, hey, who do you think would be good for this program? And do you mind sending them a quick email to tell them that it's coming up? Again, that personal touch and, um, and really connection helps people to feel a little more drawn in. Um, and then the last group, I actually didn't put this on the slide, but it's still using your people. 
take advantage of the student athletes that have already participated and have been, you know, proponents of what you're doing. If people have had good experiences in your program, give them the nudge to say, Hey, remember your experience in rising Eagles? Why don't you share that with, you know, one of your other teammates who you think would be good and, and could use some growth through the program. Um, I've had a lot of students get involved through that as well. All right, another lesson learned, and this definitely applies to both of those first two components that I've mentioned in Emerging and Rising Eagles, and that's just to stay active. Um, the, the first and biggest thing, and I even tell them this on day one in every program, is this is not another class. And I believe our students have enough classes and whatever I can do to make this not feel like the lecture that they're sitting in, uh, I, I wanna try to do that. Now at the same time, I do still bring in great readings and very detailed leadership theories and things that you could see in an academic classroom. But again, I just focus on not making it a lecture and making it as different from the traditional classroom as possible. Uh, and really that happens through active learning. Um, you see a great photo here of one of the activities we did with the Rising Eagles group this year that was a lot of fun. Uh, but active learning comes in so many different forms. It could be games, team building, other activities, um, different ways of having group discussions, getting people moving around the room. The biggest thing I can say here is mix it up, have fun, keep things loose, but in all that, don't lose sight of the goal, right? So we can have fun and we can engage with our peers and we can still learn something really important in a session. So it's finding that balance that can be really beneficial. Um, another random example is even, you know, I've included a few gifts in this presentation. That was my way of trying to keep this a little bit light. I'm sitting in a room by myself staring at a computer screen. So hopefully you've gotten at least a little amusement out of the gifts in the presentation, but things like that can help uh, just make it feel a little more lively. Um, one other example there too is again, getting your participants involved. So uh, a lot of times I'll ask the participants to share different things. Um, for this presentation, I asked people that follow me on Twitter to share their favorite gift and I got a few responses. And so those, got brought into the presentation. I've done that with students in the past as well, or I'll ask students to share their favorite song currently, and then I'll use that to make a playlist that maybe plays in the background when we're doing reflection or coming in and out of the room or different things like that. So uh, just finding ways to bring them into the process to keep it light and keep it fun. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is just to share a general session model that I typically follow um, so that there's different components within every session. So we'll have an activity, usually followed by a discussion. Then we'll have some actual teaching and learning on a, on a, a leadership lesson or a specific theory. Uh, and then some type of reflection or takeaway that helps the students to take it beyond this one hour that we're in this room together. Uh, and so the key here too is just with each of these components, it's variety. We're reaching students in different ways. Students with different learning styles can really connect with different parts of this session model. And so in different ways, we help keep everyone engaged and hopefully um, provide something that helps everyone to take, take away a learning outcome. All right, quick pause in my presentation for some shameless N4A plugs. I am a, a longtime member of the Membership Recruitment and Retention Committee from N4A. And uh, two things going on right now. First is the mentor program. We've got record numbers, I hear, from Kelsey Scher, who's overseeing the subcommittee for the mentor program. Uh, but we'd love to shatter the, the mentor and, and mentee records this year. So if you're not signed up yet, it'd be great to have you in the program. Uh, specifically, we, we always need more mentors. We typically get way more mentee requests than mentors. So even if you've only been in, uh, in your position for a few years or in N4A for a few years, there's certainly someone that you have wisdom to share with, maybe a younger professional, a GA that's in M4A, something like that. So uh, the QR code there should get you to the, the uh, application. And I really hope that we'll get a few more people signed up from this presentation. Uh, and then I'll also share as a part of the same committee, I am the subcommittee chair for the recruitment wing. And uh, I would just ask that you encourage any friends who maybe are in the industry, but are not in M4A or GAs at your institution, people who are new to the field, you know, anyone you know, invite them to join and share the gift of N4A with them today because um, as you all probably know, it's, uh, the, there's no membership fees for this year, which is awesome that N4A is supporting us in that way. So share that gift with, with others and, and hopefully we can continue to, to lean on each other through this year that's gonna be 
wild for everyone. All right, back to the AU Eagles Leadership Academy, and we'll get into the third component, which is Soaring Eagles. Once again, the mission is there, and, and we have goals that go right along with the Soaring Eagles program as well that guide our work. Um, the, the core mission here is supporting those multiple transitions of our student athletes and promoting their growth and education. So this one covers sort of an umbrella that covers a lot of different things. You see the signature events that I have listed on the screen. These are you know awesome events that happen year over year for us, and um, they're kind of one-time things that, that our students connect with. You'll also see that the newest one is the last one listed there, our Anti-Racism Education Collective, uh, which again, we, we listen to our student athletes and uh, with all of the things that have happened over the course of the summer and the, the horrible racial injustices that continue to come up, um, we heard our student athletes and their response to that. And we asked them you know, what they would need and what they would want and, and how we can help move our department forward. And this is one of the ways that we're working to do that. So to say all that, Soaring Eagles is this component that was created to be open and changing and having that flexibility is really important. Uh, and so adding this, this new initiative of the collective is just a really good example of finding ways to address the needs uh, of our student athletes and our staff and coaches as well, um, because this program is touching you know, everyone in our department in that way. And next up I'll share lesson learned number six, be flexible. Uh, that kind of goes in line with some of the things I was just referring to with Soaring Eagles. Shout out to my friend Christia Worthy for this GIF. She tweeted it at me last night. I think many of us can probably relate to that feeling in some ways right now. Uh, but the reason I think it fits for this lesson is you have to be flexible and you have to understand that even when it feels like there's a fire going on around you, uh, it's time to adapt, time to make the shift and things are not gonna be the same every year from year to year. Um, I'll share just in the context of our Leadership Academy, even the pieces of this that started almost four years ago, those things are constantly changing and adapting. And as I mentioned, we tweak the goals or we make a change to the curriculum or we add new workshops uh, in Soaring Eagles or you know, we expand to a, a new population of our student athletes for one of our programs, different things like that. So just continuing to be flexible, not getting stuck in one specific path um, is something that's really important. And then, Along with this, I'll give sort of advice for people that are in small schools or smaller units and or people in hybrid roles like mine. I mentioned at the beginning, I'm an academic advisor and academic counselor as well as overseeing all of our programs in the Leadership Academy and Student Athlete Development. And what I've come to learn is that you can't do it all, right? So you need to find the spots where you can be most effective and then do those things at the top level. And um, I've continued to learn that lesson a little bit the hard way, even this summer with, you know, adding some new things and trying to decide with that ad, is there somewhere where we need to pull back in a, in a different component of the academy, just so that I have enough capacity to do it and so that it's something that's still fitting for our students. Um, so those are kind of the two questions that I ask is, do I have the capacity and do the students absolutely need and do they want this new program? And then if it's not, find ways to connect with campus. So one of the best examples for us is we do a few programs that are focused on career and professional development, but I look around at other institutions and I know that there are our schools doing a lot more than we are. And that's okay. Some of those have more staff or, or different priorities and, and I've learned to be okay with that. But what I've done to make up for it is to try to make more connections with our campus partners in the different career centers on campus. and rather than inventing our own events, really working with them to promote the events that are already going on and encouraging our student athletes that, hey, I might not be the one running this program, but it's a really great program and it's gonna be good for you and your future. All right, the fourth and final component of, e of the AU Eagles Leadership Academy is Eagles in Service. Uh, great photo here of the first, the inaugural year of our Eagles in Service program, which was the 2018-19 academic year. Um, and the, the focus of Eagles in Service is really engaging our student athletes in an experience that is gonna be formational for them. It's focused on service learning and is something that's unique to anything else that they're doing during their time as a student athlete. Um, one of the reasons this came up 
we heard from a lot of our student athletes that they wish they could study abroad, but it's really tough to do as a student athlete unless they do it, you know, over a summer in an abbreviated program or, or some other arrangement. And so we originally created this program to take an international trip to give our students an opportunity to explore a different part of a, a new country. Um, and that is a, a very unique experience. But then we kind of rolled back as we were creating this to decide, okay, we want this to be more than just a trip. It's more than just a one week thing. So the students actually apply for this well in advance of the trip, uh, at least for the first year for, for our trip to Paraguay. And once the cohort is selected, we have regular meetings leading up to the trip where we have a whole leadership curriculum that goes along with it. We explore servant leadership theory and we talk about what it means to go to a new country and what it will mean culturally to, to meet folks that you've never met before in an area of the world that maybe you've never been to before. And then the trip is just the culminating event of all of that. It's kind of a cap on the experience. So we want to make sure that it's not just, hey, this sounds cool, I'll take a trip, but that there's a lot of development that goes along with it. And as we move forward, we, we've made the decision that it's going to be on a two-year cycle. So it's not an international trip every year, uh, but every other year. Um, many of the students that I spoke to about maybe participating in it shared, yeah, I, I would love to travel, but you know, there's also a lot that we can do here in the DC area. So, so we heard that loud and clear and with fitting in the mission of Eagles in Service, we're still going to have a program that is uh, focused on creating a, a specific experience. So it'll follow a similar model to the international trip with a cohort of students and, and all that, but our focus will be those students helping create and carry out projects here in our local community. And I'm really excited to see that happen as we move into the future um, in, in the coming years. So that's Eagles in Service. That's the fourth and final component of the Academy. So I've got two more lessons learned to wrap up here. Uh, the lesson number seven, evaluate and assess. It's not that scary. Uh, this is a huge topic and there have been full presentations about this. I know I've sat in on some of them at N4A in the past. So I certainly don't sit, claim to be an expert or know everything about assessment, but I've learned a lot from some of our great colleagues in N4A. Um, and to me, this goes back to the thing I've been mentioning really throughout this whole presentation, which is establishing your mission and goals. So when you know what you're trying to accomplish, it's much easier to measure. So that's kind of the thing number one is that you kind of have those things in place to really be able to assess them. Um, then I'll say what's been really useful to me is using pre and post surveys to measure growth. So what I'll do is create the same or very similar questions that are geared toward each of our goals and geared toward each session or each piece of the curriculum. Uh, and I'll have students answer those before participating and then once they've completed it as well. And this has just been super helpful to help us track, you know, where they think they were at the beginning of the program and how that's changed after participating. Um, I've been able to use the results very specifically to see if our curriculum is actually hitting the mark and meeting those goals that we've established. Um, I'll give one example. Two years ago in Rising Eagles, we had one session about emotional intelligence. We, we covered it in one of our monthly sessions and the results on the survey at the end of the year were not great. The growth in the understanding of what emotional intelligence is and how the students were using it on their teams, it, it showed almost no growth in that topic. And so that actually helped me guide the changes for the next year. And I had to figure out a different way to go about teaching emotional intelligence and go about helping our students to understand it. And so I mentioned earlier, the shift I made was to really make it a part of the entirety of the program, not try to teach it just in one week. And that really helps the students connect with it on a little bit of a deeper level. And so all of that, I think really speaks to the, the final piece here and uh, my Supervisor really helped me uh, to, to get to this and uh, even her supervisor, Jimmy Ellis, who I think maybe joined in on this presentation as well, helped us by, by saying, how will I use the results of this question? So on the first survey I ever created for the first shot at any program in the Leadership Academy, I had all kinds of questions about, did you enjoy this program? And I, I can't remember some of the specifics of them now, but I didn't know what I was going to do, even if the results were really good or really bad or somewhere in the middle, I had no idea how I was going to use those. So now for any question that I do on an evaluation or assessment, I ask myself, 
how will I use this, whether the results are really good or really bad or somewhere in the middle? What am I gonna do with it once I have those results? If I don't have a good answer to that question, then asking that question on a survey is probably a waste of time and then it's wasting more time for the students in filling it out. So um, that, that would be the, probably the biggest piece of advice I can give and something that's been really useful to me in trying to assess each of these different pieces. All right, last but not least, lesson learned number eight. This is our final gift that comes from a great friend and mentor of mine, my old boss, Dr. Karen Lee at Ball State. Uh, she sent me this one and this is, I think, a picture of how excited she gets to see me. But also it should be how excited you are to share your work. So the area that I've probably learned the most and been able to make the most changes to this academy has come from talking to mentors, talking to our coaches and to coaches I know from previous institutions, talking to other people in the N4A family, talking to anyone. I, I, I talked to my partner about the things that I'm doing in the academy and all of that sharing helps to just gain different perspectives from different people on what you're doing that might be working well, what new ideas, you, know, you never know what, what idea someone might have. So uh, share it as much as you can, talk to different folks. And, and I'll say, honestly, every time I've shared a piece of this program, I've typically come back with a new change, something to add, something to make it better. So um, whether you have a chance to share it in a, in a setting like this uh, or just one-on-one -on -one with, with somebody that you know, I definitely encourage you to do that. So with that said, that kind of wraps up the, the presentation here. Again, I really appreciate everyone that uh, logged in to be a part of this. Hopefully, uh, to go back to my original mission and goals, hopefully you had a little fun and hopefully I shared something of value that you'll be able to use uh, at your own institution moving forward. Um, so that's it for me. My contact info is here. Please don't hesitate to email. I reach out if I can help uh, with any ideas going forward. And I know we have a little time left, so uh, hopefully there have been a couple of questions that have been posted and uh, I'll kick it to Christine, who I think is going to be looking at that and hopefully I can answer some questions if you have any that are still coming in. Absolutely. Thank you, Spencer, for all of your insight and for sharing some phenomenal information with today's participants. Um, at this time, we have a few minutes to take a couple of questions from all of you. As a reminder, please feel free to use the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen to pose a question. We will attempt to answer as many questions as we can before the top of the hour. All right, our first question um, is, uh, is there access to handouts or a template of the goals for your program? Uh, yeah, so I create sort of a one sheet page for the Academy as a whole and then for each of the different components that um, is great for sharing, for me, for sharing with coaches um, and even sharing with our student athletes. And it really gives a picture of each program in, in sort of a one page setting. And I'm always happy to, to share some pieces of those with anyone that, that's interested in seeing them. Um, a lot of that information is stuff that was in this presentation, but I'm happy to, to share if I can. So um, again, I would say email me at, at the email here on the screen if, if you'd like to see any of that. Do you feel Rising Eagles has the same student athletes as SAC, um, specific number from each team or limited numbers? Do you force there to be at least one person from each team or no? Yeah, really good questions. Um, and that was one of the things that I was, I would say a little nervous about early on was if it's just gonna be the same students as SAC, but um, it's, it's really not been. There, there's certainly some crossover um, students that are in both. And I think that's a great, opportunity if they are in both because uh, Rising Eagles is really uh, for us a lot more focused on the actual process of developing your leadership um, skills and thinking and reflecting on on the areas that you need to grow or, or have space to grow um, and then to me SAC is a place that they can put that into action beyond you know through their sport and through their team um, so the the pairing there I think is really nicely but to the other parts of that question we have no restrictions on number from a certain team or um, certainly, I love to try to get representation from every team, and that's where a lot of the individual outreach comes into play. Um, but the first year we did it, we did not have someone from every team. Um, this was year two this past year, and we did have someone from every team, which was a, a nice growth step for us. Um, but I, I leave it open. I want it to be a program that if you're applying to be a part of it, you want to be a part of it. I'm not forcing you to do it. Your coach isn't forcing you to do it. And, there aren't any other strings attached to, to requirements for you except to engage in this development process. Thank you. 
What are your plans for social distancing with this program for the upcoming year? Yeah, that's a, that's the, the question of the hour. Um, one reason I didn't touch on that in the presentation is I was almost certain someone would ask it. Um, we're certainly making shifts. American University is in a fully online modality for the fall semester. So um, I couldn't get the athletes together in a room if I wanted to. It's, it won't, won't be allowed for, for me this semester. So um, one of the things that we've done is shifted a little bit of the timeline. So the Emerging Eagles program that I mentioned, which is number one, the foundation, we're going to hold that solely in the spring, where usually there's a couple of groups in the fall and a couple in the spring. Um, that at least gives us a little time to see if things are different come spring semester and if we're able to get back to a, a closer to a normal setting. Um, for the other pieces, we're finding ways to, to determine what we can do virtually and what we need to hit the pause button on. So um, Rising Eagles will continue as usual, but in a virtual setting. Still working through a lot of the specifics on how to keep things active and engaging in this setting, but I've been brainstorming with a lot of friends and colleagues and um, faculty at American and, and other things. So um, we're going to continue the show as usual there. Uh, and, and that goes for a lot of the other pieces too, is, you know, if we can find a way to do it effectively virtually, we will. And if we need to hit the pause button for semester, then um, we have to be okay doing that as well. Where do you get the funds for the service learning trip? Um, do the student athletes pay for it or does the leadership program? Another great question. Um, and for us, it's been a combination. So um, I'll say we've only done one year of the trip, so I can really only speak to that year. Um, we had some funds allocated from our leadership academy that went towards it. Um, I, and this was a piece I didn't talk in the presentation about, but you know, if I had more time, I'd go into more detail about encouraging you to, to work with your development people on campus. And um, as you're developing a program or leadership academy like this, that's another one of the people that you should share it with is your development team. And then even ask if, if they'll allow you to, to share the presentation of the program with any key donors that might be interested in supporting student athletes in that way. Um, and I was fortunate to, to have the chance to do that and, and share the vision of the entire academy with uh, some of our you know key people within the AU athletics sort of development world. And um, so we were able to get some support toward our budget from that avenue. Uh, and then our student athletes pitched in a, a piece as well. So um, I think one of the key things for it was that some of our student athletes had to do some fundraising um, and, and some of them had to work extra hours of, you know, their campus job if they have one or whatever it might be. And um, that just helped with ha them having some buy-in for the process as well. That it wasn't just here, we're gift wrapping a, a trip to Paraguay for 10 days for you, but, you know, they're committing something to, to being a part of that experience as well. Um, someone else also inquired about um, the virtual aspect of things, or rather how you are going to alter your processes. Um, they, um, is there any way that you can expound on any additional creative ideas that you've come up with? Yeah, sure. I mean, the first thing I'll say is I, I envision that most of the sessions will be over Zoom. Uh, and I'll, I'll expand this a little bit to say I'm teaching five sections of our AUX course that I mentioned for our freshman student athletes all on Zoom you know, once a week for each of the five sections. So um, I'll be doing a lot of, of virtual, <laughs> virtual learning, virtual teaching this semester. Um, just off the top of my head, some of the things that I've been exploring, um, different software components or online components that help you to engage students in, in the process. So there's a program called Mentimeter, which is sort of for like polling or getting real live feedback from participants um, as you're going through something. Um, a program that I haven't really explored yet, but it's through uh, Microsoft is called Pear Deck. And it's from what I've read so far, it's a way to create presentations that participants can actually engage with a little more in an active setting. Again, I haven't explored it enough yet to really know. So that's something I'm looking at. Um, certainly we'll be using a lot of breakout rooms within Zoom to facilitate smaller group conversations, um, trying to get creative with maybe keeping our sessions or our classes a little bit shorter, but giving students a little bit of time during that block that we would have a class to spend 15 minutes working on a very specific project that connects to the, the topic of that class. 
Um, so one example would be for my first week in our AUX1 class, um, I will share, I'm planning on sharing like a short video introduction of myself that I had pre-recorded. Uh, and then as we move through the first few weeks, I'm going to give students an opportunity to pre-record their own and then share that with the rest of the class as a way to kind of meet each other in the classroom space. So um, I know those are just like a couple of random ideas without going like too far down the, the virtual rabbit hole there, but uh, I'm just, you know, continuing to try to find ways to keep things different um, and ways to, to make sure that it's not just me speaking into a screen for 45 minutes, kind of like this presentation was. <laughs> What surveys do you use to measure growth? Are they based on any frameworks? Yeah, so the surveys are based on a lot of different things. Um, I've, you know, gotten feedback from other folks that do this type of work at different institutions and seeing the frameworks that they use for their surveys to kind of gather ideas. Um, but then, as I mentioned in the presentation, the, the main thing that they're based on is our own framework of our own mission and goals and pieces of the curriculum for the program. So um, just helping us to measure the growth in each of those areas that we've outlined as, you know, areas that we're hoping for the students to, to learn and, and grow in um, through the goals for that program. Do you require an application for all levels um, past emerging eagles? Um, how do you determine how many student athletes to accept? Yeah, good question. Um, so you're right, Emerging Eagles is no application because it's required for all. Um, Rising Eagles has an application. And um, one of the things I didn't mention, but I'll say now is that I, I try to keep that application somewhat short and simple. Um, I don't want it to be an additional barrier for people to see some real long application and think, oh, well, this is, I don't want to do this. So I, my hope is to bring people into the process and the application is just a way to know that they're they're in for it and they, and they really are making that active choice. Um, the components of soaring eagles, most of them do not have an application because they're more like one-time events or workshops. So um, they'll just be scheduled and shared out with the student athletes. Um, the new program that I mentioned there called the, the Anti-Racism Education Collective, um, that had what I, I wouldn't really call an application, but more of just a sign up form um, to gather some key information from people who wanted to be a part of that one. Uh, and then the Eagles in Service program has an application as well, uh, again, because it's a focused cohort model and, and we have limited capability and how many people we can take on a international trip if, if that's what we're doing that year. Um, I think the other part of the question was how do you determine how many? We don't have a set number, um, save for the trip component. You know, we might have a maximum of how many we can take on a, on a trip, but for, for anything else, we don't really have a, a set number. and. Um, what I've done in the past couple of years is just find ways to adapt to how many people apply. So um, I'm not typically in the business of using the application to turn people away from participation, uh, but rather just to, to know that they're bought in and that they're wanting to be a part of the process. Is the academy open to non-student athletes? Uh, no. So all, everything we do in the academy is um, for our our student athletes within the athletic department, division one student athletes. How do you set the attendance participation expectation for rising Eagles while not deterring student athletes to participate because of the commitment level? Yeah, it's a really good question. And that's one of the reasons that we landed on the monthly meetings for rising Eagles is um, the first year we tried it, we, we did a little more frequent than that. And uh, again, was one of the questions that I asked the students after completing it. Well, what, what would you want to see differently? Were the meetings too many, not enough, whatever. And um, so we, we heard that feedback and, and made the shift. Uh, and then as far as just setting the standard, um, we just kind of set that foundation in week one. We talk about the importance of why everyone's there. Um, typically one of the things we'll do in week one is allow everyone to share a little bit about why they applied to be a part of the program and what they're hoping to get out of it. Um, and that sort of puts it out into the universe, into the space of, of, the, of the group so that there's some accountability within the group. Um, and then I certainly set a standard as well by saying, you know, here's what I expect of you. And I ask them, what do you expect of me as the facilitator? How can I help you grow? Um, I haven't had any participation attendance type issues in the, the couple years that Rising Eagles has been going. 
Um, certainly here or there, someone will not make a session for one reason or another. And um, I just try to connect with them individually then and make sure, one, just make sure they're doing okay. You know, if there's a reason that they weren't able to make it, there might be something else going on that I don't know about. Um, two, then it gives me a chance to catch them up on what they missed in the session. And then three, it's just to reiterate the importance of them being there and, and hopefully, you know, making it to the rest of the sessions. How do you lay out on the calendar so that each year's program can operate concurrently? Quite literally, I, I typically print out like a month calendar view for semester by semester. Usually like over the summer, I'll print one out for August through December, one page for each month. And I'll include on there all of the athletic events, anything else that might be important and relevant, uh, and then find where I can kind of fit everything in and puzzle pieces together. Um, it's, it's quite a process. And again, that's one of those things that just, I think it's very unique to every institution. What are things that might conflict with you and your institution, even down to the class level? I, I know at some places classes meet at very specific times and at American, I have some students that have classes like well into the evening, which might be different than at, at other places. So um, sometimes that's something that we have to adapt to, but um, yeah, in a very in a simple sense, I just get way into the weeds of the, the entire calendar and try to find open dates to fit everything in week by week. How do you fund your gear they were, um, they were wearing in the photos and how do you make sure it is um, equitable among programs? Yeah, so um, that's just something that I budget for in our Leadership Academy budget and I haven't had the budget for it every year, so it, it kind of depends year by year. Um, we've been really fortunate in years past that our conference, the Patriot League, has supported the efforts of leadership academies at the institutions within the Patriot League. Um, so typically, some of the funding has come from that. Um, and then as far as like as equitable distribution, um, it, for me, it's a lot of times just depending on, on numbers and um, participation in the program. So um, since we've done GEAR, the Emerging Eagles program every year has been a t-shirt um, that they get. So that's the same year over year. And because that's the required program, it's in a sense, it's equitable because every single student athlete will get that, you know, year one t-shirt. Um, and then from there, it's, again, yeah, it's really budget dependent if we have the ability to get a piece of gear that, that represents the Leadership Academy for the other stages. Do you hold emerging and rising eagles on the same night or same weeks? Sometimes, yeah. Again, just kind of depends on the the schedule matrix as it comes out. Um, typically, I, I think I mentioned this briefly. Most of our stuff happens on Monday or Tuesday nights um, as nights that tend to fit best with our student athletes. And um, I've had semesters where I'll have emerging eagles from six thirty to seven thirty, and then rising eagles from eight to nine, or or something like that. And, um, as a staff member and a facilitator and just for my own well-being, I actually really like those ones because I can just plan one night that week to knock out two big programs and then I'm not having to do, you know, Monday night and Tuesday night are, are super late nights. Um, so, but it, it all depends on the student schedules and what we can make work in a given week and a given semester. I think we're uh, about out of time for any additional questions. Um, so thank you all for your thoughtful questions and participation. Spencer, are there any final comments um, before we conclude today's presentation? No, I, I guess I would just say one more thank you to N4A for um, awarding us with this Model Practices Award. I'm really, really grateful for that. And Christine, thanks for, for hosting this and allowing me to share this work and, and appreciate everyone that showed up to, to hear about it. Absolutely. It was more than my pleasure. And this was phenomenal information that you shared today. So on behalf of M4A and its leadership, thank you for taking the time out of your day to provide some helpful information and best practices for our membership. Uh, that concludes today's presentation. We hope you all have a wonderful day. And thank you so much um, for joining us this afternoon. Take care.